Welcome, everyone. This is Jack Hittery, and I want to welcome our special guest today, Parag Khanna. Parag Khanna, newest book is Move, The Forces Are Brooding Us. And Parag is a well-known thinker and advisor and catalyst for great discussion uh, in so many countries. He himself is definitely on the move. Uh, he's been to more than a, well, well over 100 countries uh, during the pandemic, I think was mainly in Singapore, but uh, now once again is, is on the move. He's well known for his many, many books, and please look him up online for the many influential works uh, that he's done, both in book form and also the many articles in the Financial Times, National Geographic, most recently, uh, and many other venues. Uh, he received his PhD from the London School of Economics uh, and his bachelor's and master's degrees from Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I want to welcome Parag Khanna. Parag? Jack, thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be with you and to uh, to be able to have this honor of doing another authors at uh, Google Talk. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Hello to Googlers, uh, wherever you are in the world. And um, and this is my third one. Sadly, it's virtual, but you guys are doing an amazing job in uh, making it feel very lifelike and as if we're, we've all moved and convened together in uh, one place. So let me go ahead and jump in and start the presentation. Um, give a Brad, brief overview. Brad, as you Brad, as you bring up the presentation, let me just remind the viewers to please uh, start up your questions. If you can pop your questions into the chat area, uh, we'll get to questions pretty soon. Parag will start off with 15, 20 minutes of his core argument in the new book, and then we'll have time to entertain questions from the audience. So please start asking your questions and get them in the chat. Go ahead, all yours, Prague. Excellent, thank you so much. So I've titled this, Why Mobility is Destiny. And in a way, it uh, follows upon other arguments, or it's, a, it's in a way a continuation of a series of arguments I've been making. I'm obsessed with geography. And in geography, there is a saying, of course, geography is destiny. It's a phrase that even non-geographers know. But one of my previous books called Connectography actually argued that connectivity is destiny. And I looked at the worldwide infrastructure networks that we, and Google has been a big part of this, have been building out across the planet. Fiber optic internet cables, highways, railways, uh, oil pipelines, electricity grids, and so forth, and how that remaps the world. This time I wanted to look at human geography, which is to say the, the, the geography of us, if you will. And it's something that's very often neglected in our maps, but it's a direct consequence of political geography and of functional geography. So this is the story of our present and future human geography. That's where it fits. Now, there's something that's ironic about human geography is that we often don't map it. We don't put it on our walls. We look at uh, maps of in the environment, maps of politics, but we don't often study this but it is incredibly dynamic. And so I wanted to really analogize it here to climatology. Human geography is really, um, again, a sort of deep science of our species. And it doesn't often get treated in that way, but there are reasons for why we are where we are. And there's many drivers that will shape where, will we, where, where we will be next. And that was the question that I set out to answer. In fact, I set myself the modest goal originally in writing this book of answering the simple question, where will you live in 2050? It turns out that we are going to be a moving target, uh, but we'll come to the conclusion in just a bit. So there are four layers of geography or natural geography or political geography or functional geography and our human geography. And we far too often view these in isolation, even though each of them is in fact very dynamic. If you look at just natural geography, we may not dispute uh, that we should use green for the forests and brown for the deserts and uh, blue for the oceans. However, only now are people beginning to appreciate because of climate change just how dynamic natural geography is. When the ice caps melt, you have less white. When forests are cut down, you have less green. When sea levels rise, you have more blue. And that, of course, affects, again, our, um, our, our fundamental location in the world. Political geography, too, has had a huge impact uh, on, our, on our location. Uh, when the United Nations was founded in 1945, it had 51 members. Today, it has 200 members. So this is not a permanent, fixed, immutable map. Nations don't even necessarily have a fixed, immutable identity. We treat them that way because maps have power, psychological power. They condition us to think that there is some permanence to these lines. But these are the most arbitrary lines on the map, and they always have been, and they continue to be. 
and they also betray a sense of equality across sovereign units. But we know that no such equality actually exists. There's real hierarchies. Some states exist more on the map than they do in reality. Um, and some places may be large, but not have a lot of people or have a lot of economic activity or resources. So again, this is one layer and it's also very, very dynamic. Then, as I mentioned before, the functional geography, which we spend more on as a civilization, as a species, we spend about two to three trillion dollars a year building more infrastructure and more connectivity. But we don't put this on our maps in our schools or in our offices, but we should. Actually, uh, when this book, Connectography, came out some years ago, I had some maps like this blown up and I shared them with friends at Google uh, because I think that you are genuine agents, of course, of building global uh, connectivity. Um, and then there is the human geography. So again, here too, we'll ask yourself, why are we where we are? Well, for one thing, the majority of the world population is in Asia and has been in Asia uh, for much of history, but particularly over the last uh, 100 years as the world population has quadrupled. Now, more than half of humanity lives just on the eastern part, if you will, of this one map, which doesn't even include the entire Western Hemisphere. But then you also have to bring into account um, the, the intersection of all of these layers. If I could construct a perfect map, if you will, although it would have to be a dynamic and changing one, it would look something like this. If I, you wanted to, if you asked me, show me how the world works. I wouldn't show you just borders. I wouldn't show you just internet cables and pipelines. I wouldn't show you just people. And I wouldn't show you just resources. I would show you all of them at the same time. Now, I hope you agree that this is a beautiful composite, you know, uh, and, it, and it reflects reality in many ways. But what it also does is explain why the world is so complex. The reason the world is so complex is because the world is so connected. And the feedback loops among people among infrastructure, among borders, among uh, resources is so rapid and dynamic. And that accounts for a lot of the, the uncertainty about the future and the complexities because of the fact that we have built this hyper-connected world amongst our different geographies. Now, we have to respond as well in terms of our human geography to a couple of factors that I'll go into more detail on now. One is demographics and the other is environment. We're in living through a very, very unique uh, period, if you will, in, in human history, in the history of the human species, which is what I call peak humanity. Global fertility actually began to decline in the 1970s, but we're really starting to feel it now, particularly in the last 15 years. Why? Well, the first is because of the, the two baby busts that we've had, or rather the two baby busts are the two main reasons why. The first baby bust was during the financial crisis of 2008. After that, fertility really tapered around the world because of the economic stress that it caused. The second is now, of course, COVID. And uh, there, here too, we are currently experiencing a baby bust of a significant decline in fertility. If you take the two factors together, we are continuously reducing our projection around the total maximum human population size that we will achieve. And we're bringing it further closer towards the present. So for example, 20, 25 years ago, it was not uncommon to forecast that the world population would reach 15 billion people. But now nothing of the sort is gonna happen. I make the case that we will probably not even reach 9 billion people, which corresponds roughly to this rapid decline scenario. And we will reach that peak probably within the next 15 to 20 years. Again, a huge shift in uh, the forecast over the last um, generation. Now, let's look at the impact of the two baby busts that I just mentioned. For the last 100 years of our life on this planet, each generation is given birth to a larger generation than itself, right? Uh, and that's how the world population also quadrupled from 2 billion people in 1920 to uh, 8 billion people by the, by, uh, the present or uh, you know, past the year 2000. So it only took 90 years roughly to quadruple the world population. But what you see here when you look at this dashed line is my forecast around what is this, uh, this COVID correction which is to say that Generation Z, which is today's teenagers, uh, roughly, uh, represent about, uh, you know, reached a peak population of 1.86, 1.9 billion people. And had we not had these, uh, you know, baby bus, Generation Alpha 
might have been on track to become larger than Generation Z. Instead, what's happening is that when we revisit this question in the year 2026, 2027, when we look at how many babies were born in the complete cycle of Generation Alpha, it will probably be the case that Generation Alpha is smaller than Generation Z. So that's a special moment. Generation Z becomes the largest generation that mankind has ever and probably will ever produce. And it goes downhill from there. The only question is how rapidly. Now, this has staggering implications because in terms of economics, we've more or less been able to take for granted that there will be people coming after us in ever larger number and that there will be consumers and renters and homeowners and so forth. That's not necessarily true. Now, many people would say, well, this is you know, certainly good for the environment. And I do you know, sort of weigh the notion that this is actually part of our preservation instinct as a species in light of climate change and the, and the concerns, the ecological consciousness that young people have, that they're less likely to have more children. And that now we have to think about this peak human population of eight billion or eight and a half to nine billion people in the year 2040, and then distributing ourselves around the world in a new way, in light of the second factor, climate change. So what you're seeing here is, uh, and I think this is probably, many of you have seen variations of this, the study that shows the change in the suitability for habitation of geographies around the world as temperatures rise. And places that are turning green are becoming more habitable, places that are turning red are becoming less habitable. And what's really ironic, and you could say perverse about this situation, is that the places that are turning green are also depopulating because fertility levels are lowest in wealthy northern countries, whereas the overpopulated areas of the world are also turning red and becoming less livable. And again, you know, the fundamental purpose of this book is to realign our geographies, to reimagine an alignment or a better and more productive and more fruitful and more survivable alignment of the geography of people, borders, infrastructure, and resources. So the more you think about the demographic plateau of the world, of peak humanity, and climate change, the more you appreciate how suboptimal uh, our present distribution is around the world. So the question I set out to answer is, well, what are we going to do about it? Is mobility destiny because of all of these reasons? Are people going to be forced physically as human beings, as mammals, we have a fight or flight instinct. What is going to be our response collectively to this situation and these unfolding uh, events and trends? And I don't necessarily predict that we're going to have these large scale migrations, but I do advocate that we do so in the name of that collective preservation of our species. If you look around the world, every region has to go through this process of thinking about where the niche is moving. And let's remember, for the last 10 to 12,000 years, we settled within certain comfortable latitudes, what, what is known as the climate niche, mostly between 20 and 30 degrees north latitude. It's not an accident, of course. We live near water, we live near the coast, and we live in temperate climates. Um, but that climate niche is shifting. And the same scientists who have produced this suitability change index argue that for every one degree of temperature rise you have, um, one billion people fall out of the climate niche. So whether you're in North America or other parts of the world, that will have an impact. No place is immune. In the U.S., for example, you still have people moving away from the Great Lakes and Rust Belt region and moving south into the Sun Belt. But the Sun Belt is, of course, going through a mega drought. And places like the Gulf Coast uh, states, Florida and Texas, are uh, heavily exposed to tropical storms, rising sea levels, and so forth. So could it be that there is going to be a new great migration to the north? Now, the U.S., for example, is on the cusp of legislating, you know, gradually, um, too gradually, some might say, or too timidly, trillions of dollars in new infrastructure investment. But how far-sighted is it? Are we, take, are we going through the thought process that I call the climate migration infrastructure nexus? Think about the geographies that are going to be most suitable for human habitation rather than being trapped in a survivalist mode. Think about um, where the, whether people are going there or can be encouraged to go and relocate to these stable areas and then build your robust 
uh, sustainable infrastructure accordingly. And of course, that's not the way most countries approach this, um, neither the United States nor elsewhere. But we have to start to think that way. So what happens to, you know, if you look at the map, this is a map that was produced for me just looking at uh, global agriculture production, the geography of organic agriculture production in a world where temperatures have risen four degrees Celsius. So admittedly, that's an extreme scenario, but you get there again gradually, not overnight. Today, for those who don't know, the countries that are the largest food producers in the world are the United States, Brazil, um, India, China, and Australia. Now, what color are those countries in this scenario, right? Not exactly fertile agricultural terrain anymore. Now, what are the two largest and most depopulated countries on the planet, Russia and uh, Canada? Where does this map tell you most of the world's food is being grown? Russia and Canada. Now, is this exactly the way it's going to play out? No. Is it sudden and overnight? No. Could a lot of things go, go be different in this? Of course. Should we prepare for this as a possible scenario? Yes, we should. Is technology going to play a role in allowing us to stay in places that are, uh, you know, brown and and seemingly unlivable? Of course it will, whether it's air conditioning or whether it's hydroponic agriculture. Yes, you can. But will you want to? And will we want to? Those are questions that we need to start to answer. In the book, I cover the entire planet. I have chapters on Canada. I have chapters on uh, South America, Africa, Middle East, East Asia, you name it, the Arctic countries and so forth. And I look at whether or not they can or cannot absorb more people and what would the politics and economics and cultural changes be like. But I explore four scenarios, really. This is, you know, you can't predict the future when it's so complex, as I said before. So the safest bet is to build scenarios and to think about their probability, their likelihood in different parts of the world. So the thing about scenario planning is that all of them could be true. All of these four scenarios that I sketch out in the book and that form the scaffolding for the book are actually true right now at the same time and will probably continue to be true. The question will be where. Where are you seeing evidence of a regional fortress scenario where countries are saying, we're going to focus on our own environmental sustainability, our own food production, our own technology stack, and we'll give a little bit of support to other countries to be more um, energy resilient or to um, you know, be, be resilient to agricultural devastation. But we're definitely not going to let more migrants in, right? So that's a high sustainability for some places, but low migration scenario. There is more of a hunter-gatherer scramble kind of survivalist scenario that I call the New Middle Ages in which our investments in sustainable technologies don't work out and we don't allow a lot of migration. And this is very much a, a localized kind of, kind of world. Then there's barbarians at the gate, which is a very crude you know, description of a world that's like the Middle Ages, but you bring in mass migration and resource conflicts that, uh, that could break out over food and water between countries or civil wars. Uh, that could happen. And then there's the fourth and final, and note there's only one of the scenarios that's genuinely positive, where we evolve our civilizational model entirely. And we think about a more fluid and circular population. In fact, the, the term that I use, the umbrella concept I use is what I call a civilization 3.0, uh, which is mobile and circular. People are, allowed, people are allowed greater mobility, even if it's done gradually and in a structured and premeditated way. But the, but the way in which we build and design our habitats and our settlements uh, is more circular, which is to say more sustainable, more self-sufficient. So I leave it to you to answer which scenario is going to happen where, or what we can do, what you can do to bring about a more positive scenario. And part of what has to motivate people is to see what could go wrong and to see what's, uh, you know, how awful other scenarios could be, which is why I feel that on the eve of the COP26 summit, for example, we need to do a lot more to seize the moment uh, beyond the present dialogue. And I'll, uh, you know, on this slide, what I wanted to show is some of the places that I tour in the book, not all, but some of the places that I call the climate oases, you know, places that don't have high populations today, but it could have higher populations tomorrow. And again, I, I look at each of them, not just in terms of their climate suitability, but their cultural, their political adaptation uh, to become places that could absorb greater populations. And again, I don't know if this will actually happen but I try to lay the ground for what could be this civilization 3.0, what could be this Northern Lights scenario. So there's a lot more to say if we wanna dig down into the places and the technologies 
and the values and cultural shifts and the investments that are going to be needed. Um, and I look forward to talking about all of that with you, Jack, and all of you um, that are here, part of this conversation. But for now, let me pause and turn it back over to you, Jack. Thank you so much. Prague, Prague thank you. Uh, that was a great introduction to the concepts of the book. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so let's try to get to them and uh, we'll get this discussion going. First, let's talk about the COVID catalyst itself. Normally, when we think about migration, we think about people leaving their home country and moving to a country other than where they were based. But with COVID, we also saw the reverse of that. People had to go back to a home country. They were either working or getting education in some other country by their own choice. And then because of expired visas, borders closing, all the pandemic impacts, they had to go back to their home country and then could not tap into the educational resources, the work opportunities, and in general, that cross-fertilization opportunity that we've been used to across so many countries in the last many decades. Talk about that trend and talk about the impact that this retreat back to home country has had and will have. It's a great question, Jack. And you know what? What has happened? It's so ironic because 2019 marked the high point of international mobility. In 2019, 1.5 billion people had crossed borders, uh, which was an all-time record. Almost 300 million people were living outside of their home country. And then you had the Great Reset, right? The lockdown was also a Great Reset. To this day, Jack, there are still people going home. The largest movement of people during the pandemic was South Asian guest workers, construction workers going back to India and Pakistan, for example. And as those projects stalled, they returned home and they went back to villages and cities. They became farmers and they no longer had those livelihoods and that, that those salaries that they were earning. To this day, Jack, there are people from New Zealand still waiting in queue to return home to New Zealand because you have to actually they're opening up limited uh, hotel spaces for quarantine. So they're only letting X number of New Zealanders return home. So this return movement is happening still, which is to say that the world was never really truly locked down. People were going back. And this means that this reset, to put it in, in one sentence, is almost like the overlap of geography and nationality was reset. People went home, right? So you are where you belong, your country of citizenship, for example. So the question is, you know, what are the negative, positive or negative implications of that and what comes next? Well, remarkably, there has been a rebound. So if you look at Britain, Britain has actually just admitted a record number of foreign students, um, which is really a surprise given that they have a shortage of truck drivers and, you know, they've been, they've had Brexit, obviously, as a major, you know, political crisis. And yet, you see that they were actually capitalizing on the Trump administration in the US to lure more foreign students and reduce the requirements for people to come in despite Brexit. So under the, rate, under the political radar, they said, we need people. We now have data around what's happening in the US and actually a very high number, consistent with the last few years, number of student visas were issued to Chinese to come back as well. So this is one particular axis that we worry about because of course the people to people exchange with, with Chinese who represent by far the largest number of international students in the world, you know, you could, you could have feared would be permanently cut off and that Chinese would not return to the US, would not return to Europe and so forth. But fortunately they are coming back. And the number of Chinese and Asians in Europe is growing significantly both as an alternative to the U.S., but also simply because ties between Europe and Asia are thriving, including with specifically with China. So you will have new movements. And fortunately, with digitization, people have sort of you know, kept in touch, so to speak. So I think that I don't worry that we're going to no longer have a global conversation because there have been aspects of a reset. Instead, we should think of it as a recirculation. And the beautiful thing is that countries realize, the lockdown taught countries that you really miss tourists when they're gone. You miss foreign students when they're gone. You miss the business travelers when they're gone. Do you remember what one of the operative words were, was, Jack, in 2019? It was a meme of the year, was toxic tourism, right? And now who's saying toxic tourism? Countries are saying they're desperate for tourists. How many countries had nomad visas in 2019? About two. How many have nomad visas today? 75. Yeah. So I don't worry about populism and xenophobia taking over and 
you know, destroying our, our international inner, you know, civil cultural ties because countries that are depopulating eventually wake up and realize, oh my God, we need people. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fascinating trend to watch both what happened in the last two years and now uh, as that uh, the counter examples happen as well. You spoke about uh, the nomad visas. Let's actually pick up on that theme, the nomadic theme. And uh, I think you have a slide on this that maybe we want to bring up in terms of Kibo and other interesting startups uh, and the and the mega trend around this kind of lifestyle that, again, did exist in the last number of years, but really now is being empowered by, by a whole range of venture back startups and other facilitators. Maybe you want to talk about this trend as well. Absolutely. And let's, let's, let's look at this slide. So, you know, to me, there are platforms emerging that enable greater mobility, you know, and I want to look at some of them um, that, that have the greatest impact. So online education, right? So you can be a remote student, you can be doing online courses and collecting badges. You don't less than fewer and fewer students go to one place for exactly four years and live in that place, you know, the way you and I kind of remember. Um, and uh, now you have digitization of health records. This is very important. So health migration, um, you know, health, medical tourism, for example, has been a very big factor in people's movement. But now with digital health records and paired with that, digitization of pension payments and subsidies by governments allow people to collect that uh, money on their in their mobile bank account and spend it anywhere. So one of the things I write about actually in the book is cruise ships. Elderly people aren't necessarily sedentary anymore. It can be cheaper to retire on a cruise ship and spend your life as an elderly person hopping among cruise ships than to live on land. Um, and you'll just collect your pension payments from your government and use them to pay for medical services on cruise ships that are retrofitting themselves and becoming floating hospitals. Of course, you've got broadband internet and 5G everywhere now, car sharing agreements. You know, if you look at co co working, you don't just join WeWork or whatever in one place, it's a passport to every single WeWork anywhere on the planet Earth. You have more and more of the co-living uh, arrangements as well, in which uh, you know you don't own a home, and obviously young people have a, the lowest rate of home ownership in Western countries in many generations. So people buy access to live in apartments and units and you know um, co-living spaces, and this is obviously a thriving space in terms of where VC money is going. Uh, you mentioned you know trailer homes and trailer parks. This was one of the best selling items or, you know, during the pandemic in Europe and America were RVs and trailer homes. Um, and I think people again, people, young people have that instinct that says, wait a minute, I'm going to I can be in a remote office forever, but I don't know where I want to be. And I don't want to buy a home and have debt, even though I can just, you know, maybe afford a suburban house. Why don't I just buy a trailer home and I'm going to put a, you know, Starlink satellite connection on top of it and drive around. And that's also very climate resilient. Uh, it, you're, you're debt free and you're climate resilient because you can always just move. And I okay, think this right, just, to, just to drill in for a second on the co-living you mentioned, just to emphasize for the audience, and people may know this, but most of the co-living arrangements now are not just like the co-living that we saw in the early 2000s, just one location, say in San Francisco on a boat that's tied to the dock. Uh, but these are really actually now international hotspots where you buy into a membership and you can then spend time at each of those locations over the Absolutely. course of the year, particularly as as COVID right. restrictions uh, loosen up. Yeah. And the and the companies that do this are, are getting clever. They're looking at the data. They're looking at, you know, flight tracker and, and you know, IATA. And they're saying, hey, where are young people? popping? What is social media saying? Is it Tulum, Mexico? Is that the hot spot? Is it Phuket? Is it Bali? Is it Dubai? I was in Dubai last week. I could not believe how many young people had picked up the golden visa that they offer. Again, the nomad visa that we were talking about. So many countries are doing it. And um, and so you bounce around these places and you just look online to see which, you know, sort of residence club has a space available in a place where you want to go. And I talk about places that are not all that popular, that not are not in the consciousness of most people like Tbilisi, Georgia. And I mean, when I first went to Tbilisi, it was a pretty rundown post-Soviet kind of backwater. You go there today and American English is the lingua franca and it feels like East Berlin. Um, so there's so many new places that are popping up on the map for, for young people to more or less pick and choose. 
Yeah, it's interesting. And we're seeing definitely uh, a younger demographic joining in on these. But what's also interesting, another question related to this is that when we saw the mass reurbanization of the last 20 years, we definitely saw a lot of young people coming into the downtown city centers. Portland, Oregon is an example, many other examples. We also saw the empty nesters. The empty nesters who went to the suburbs to raise their kids and now were empty nesters and they decided to uh, dematerialize. They wanted to give up that big home in the suburbs. They came back to city center. They're walkable now to what they want to walk to. What, what is your prediction for that demographic, this demographic that's now lighter and wants to uh, either come back to city center or maybe even take advantage of some of these kind of programs? It's a great question. It would depend on the city, you know, and I, I actually use the anecdote in the book of my own parents and where I grew up in uh, upstate New York, because it's a very climate resilient area. But because the property sizes are larger, while the American family size is shrinking, you have the largest number of single occupant, you know, single member households in American history. So why would they want a large house in a suburb? you know, that that is, you know, pricey. So the price of those climate resilient properties have been coming down until the pandemic when people said, oh, why would I be cooped up in a condo, you know, when I can have lots of space? So the, the trend cuts in both directions and it will depend on price. Rent in San Francisco and New York would have to come down, you know, considerably to fully replenish, you know, the, the, the population and to ensure a pipeline into the future. And they would have to be climate resilient, which is an iffy proposition, right? If you're looking at um, sea level rise and tropical storms and, you know, hurricanes and all this kind of thing. So, but the key thing to remember, Jack, is that a lot of times we have this archetype in our heads when we say the city, what is the future of the city? People just have in their head New York City or San Francisco. But cities have a 7,000 year history and cities are always competing with each other. The city always wins. The question is which city? So Miami is winning for now, but Detroit could have a great resurrection because it's a far more climate resilient place to be than almost any other city in America. So what you could say right now about that city is different from what you would say 10 years from now about the same place. And the same is true of Minneapolis, as you may know, one of the fastest growing or hottest property markets in America right now is Boise, Idaho. You would not have said that in the year 2016, right, or 2015. Yeah. So it's really remarkable how dynamic it is and how rapidly people can shift because they own fewer assets than before. And it's not just domestic, and this is the key thing, it's international, right? The, the, excessive, the access that passports have Again, notwithstanding the pandemic lockdown, but one of the points I made, uh, you know, that slide is that, you know, uh, uh, the, the passport app is coming and the pandemic is the reason why. The pandemic has been the reason for this great lockdown, the likes of which we have never experienced in human history. But because now in order to travel, you have to have a QR code and a vaccine certificate online, everything else can go online too, Jack. Right. What was your itinerary? What's your financial history, criminal history? It's all online anyway. What are we going to do to put it in a, on the blockchain in a way that's secure, that's accessed only by the authorities that need it when they need it to enable greater mobility and digitization of mobility? So for me, the passport app is really that plus obviously crypto and e-wallets make for a really important set of trends that the technology community is rightly putting so much effort into because those are the crucial steps that enable young people, the four and a half billion young people of the world to be more mobile, just when the world needs them to be mobile, to be building and occupying the stable, environmentally, you know, sort of, uh, sort of suitable habitats of the world. Yeah, no, great points. And actually that discussion of the city uh, leads it to the next question we have, which is there's been quite a number of countries more and more now, it seems, want to get in on the trend of creating model cities, sustainable cities of the future. Mazda has been around for years and years. Then Neom, then Fefa, then uh, in China, there's at least 10 that I know of the Chengdu future city, the car-free net city near Shenzhen. Talk about these experiments. Have they been influential? Have they actually borne fruit? What is your assessment now, a decade or two into some of these experiments? What is your analysis of their influence? Are they just interesting experiments or would they actually take hold 
and influence the actual city life that we have going forward? It, such a great question. It, it has been 10 to 20 years. I've been going to these projects for 10 to I 20 years. I know you years. have. That's <laughs> right. It's time, uh, it's time for an assessment, bro. Yeah. So it, it's, it's very good to take stock. Now, here's my view. I've been a smart city enthusiast in the sense that I believe that we should use more technology to make urban life more seamless, right? If you look at Helsinki, Finland, no young person owns a car. They wouldn't know what to do with it, right? They don't have driver's licenses. They just use an app and you get on a scooter, you get on a tram, you use um, you know, bike sharing, whatever, ride sharing, you get around. You don't even think about ownership of vehicle. Now, that I, why am I using that example? Because it's actually a real living organic city of a couple of hundred thousand people that has cracked the code around sinking human behavior with seamless mobility. And that's a good example of applying technology. Now, these smart city projects tend to be very small. It's like a district of a city, right? If you think of Tianjin Eco City or Mostar, you know, these they have populations of maybe 10, 20,000 people, right? But the challenge we have, Jack, in the world is 8 billion people. So when I stop and assess what has been their value added, it's certainly not their size or their scale. It's at their test beds. There are places where you can say, how would... Um, you know, sort of telemedicine work uh, in an urban environment, right? Where would I locate? Let me think about where I put health clinics or maybe have them move around and let me experiment in a place where there's not a lot of traffic so I can see if it works. And these kinds of things are happening. Or if I wanted to do a neighborhood out of container, uh, you know, container housing, you take shipping containers and build affordable housing out of it. You do that on the outskirts of a city. You say, look, this is a smart city designated area. Or you do what they're doing in Dubai, where you say in this zone, it's going to be a special set of biotech regulations or a test bed for drones. And we're going to have different laws and policies around that. So I, I definitely think there's still an immense value regulatorily and experimentally for these kinds of things. But what I'm looking for, Jack, is scale, because we have a crisis of, you know, Big, big mega cities that have 30, 40, 50 million people are not desirable, right? You don't voluntarily say, I want to go live in Jakarta. I want to live in Lagos, Nigeria. I want to live in Sao Paulo. These cultures have rich history and culture, and there's amazing experiences to be had there, but they're not functionally you know, working very well. So we need to untangle this box of the, of the mega city. So if we can just pull up the slides, I have two quick slides on this. Um, that helped to illustrate what you were talking about. One is what we're doing in terms of um, arcology, right? Where does, uh, you know, architecture meet sustainable uh, ecology? And what are some of the experiments going on there? The building that you see in the background is Bjarke Engel's uh, pow new power station in Copenhagen. It's a, a, so it's a power station, but also a ski slope and a climbing wall and a kind of park all rolled into one. And he's even proposed floating cities, Right. And right now he's saying, you know, 10 to 50,000 people or something like that, still relatively small. You know, how do we move buildings around? How do we do this more of this biomimicry, right? So that we can actually have sustainable agriculture or, or, or architecture at scale and use obviously more um, of available materials, less concrete, for example, uh, to develop these designs. And then let me go to the, um, the, the next slide as well uh, here. And these are more examples of self-sustainable sort of circular cities, if you will. Um, you know, the Netherlands, I would say, is among the most advanced. We didn't we didn't bring that up yet. But the, in the Netherlands, they're doing these projects where you have um, communities that are basically fully circular. Rainwater collection, wastewater treatment and recycling, channel water into hydro and aquaponic uh, for, uh, agriculture. So you're doing lab grown, you know, pl uh, 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 plant based meat and, and, uh, and, um, you know, sort of these, uh, you know, sort of greenhouses, um, renewable energy through, um, uh, wind and solar, you know, switchable battery packs attached to houses and this kind of thing. And effectively you can move these settlements, right? They're kind of like, you know, um, uh, what's happening with a uh, bow clock and other companies where you can have like flat pack homes, you can fit homes on the back of a truck and move them around. So this kind of thing is gaining ground. Again, I want to see a lot more investment in this area. You know, um, 
uh, programmable matter and you know for for four D, if you will, uh, construction and so forth. There's a lot to be said for building and designing our our settlements to have a much lighter footprint. Last point in China. They, because of the pandemic, they're building a couple of new cities that are meant to be able to lock themselves down and be fully self-sufficient in terms of their food production and energy. Well, Mark, I think there's a slide on on Xiongan, which may be in a slide or two, uh, if we can turn to that. I think this is a fascinating, or maybe there's a slide before that. Uh, I don't know if you have the slide here. Maybe oh, not. Did it go? Okay. It disappeared. Sorry. Um, it's right. But yeah, so yeah, talk about Xiongan. This is interesting. This is about 60 miles from Beijing. If you can share with the audience what the intention of the Chinese is with this kind of COVID or pandemic, uh, future, you know, future protected pandemic uh, city. Right. So it's not only uh, the food and the and the energy that I mentioned earlier, but here's the key thing, as you see in the, in the text here, it's the manufacturing, right? So having the 3D printing capability to be self-sufficient in terms of your manufactured goods is absolutely critical to all of this. And of course, you can by being able to, to import digitally designs of anything from anywhere and if you have that stock of uh, material whether it is plastics or other petrochemical products or even organic material that can be printed you can actually have not just survivability survivability but on an ongoing basis of self-sufficiency so that is what they're aspiring to in this young project great Next question is on supply chains. COVID was a really harsh lesson for all of us on the brittleness of our supply chains. We all assumed they were quite robust uh, until this, this occurred. And now we have wave after wave of chip shortages and backups in terms of even just docks to uh, bring the containers off the ships, lack of trucks and drivers for the trucks. Uh, so we're seeing it roil through so many economies around the world. What, what lessons have you taken away as you've uh, analyzed this on supply chain brittleness? How do we get to a more resilient supply chain, uh, both for key infrastructure as well as for the many products that we send around the world? It's, you know, I think that I, I hope that we are in the storm before the calm, uh, because this is definitely a moment again, where supply chains are at a breaking point. I want to emphasize again, because it's not the first time that we have a chip shortage, for example, that's having a negative impact on uh, on the computing industry and, and now automotive and so on. We should have learned from previous you know, instances, whether it's water shortages or the earthquake uh, in Taiwan or other, other scenarios. So we need to have far more regionally centered economies. Let me give some evidence of why we're moving in that direction despite the breaking point. Number one, trade agreements. At the height of the pandemic, Jack, the um, uh, US, Mexico, and Canada signed the USMCA trade agreement, right? The US now trades more with Canada and more with Mexico than does with China. The EU moved towards a fiscal compact. Asian signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So trade has become more regional and countries have realized that they should source more of their energy, materials, goods, and so forth from their own neighbors, from their own neighborhood. And I think that's a permanent reality. As much as we could end the pandemic and move towards, you know, just in time frictionless supply chains again, and certain technologies will allow us to monitor and have foresight on potential disruptions, we still should bias towards the local. And that's happening. So that's one. The other is, of course, what's happening with energy. So much more capacity for localized renewable energy production and additive manufacturing and you know localized production of goods through 3D printing, such that even if you don't have a robust labor force, you have that capacity to automate production. And that's, of course, something that's accelerating now in the wake of the pandemic. Investments in industrial robotics will, will accelerate in the wake of the pandemic because countries, whether it's the U.S. or whether it's Germany or Korea or China or Japan, don't want to be caught in a situation where they're dependent on human labor that's vulnerable to a disease. So you'll see a significant acceleration of automation and therefore autonomous production, if you will. So a couple of these trends are pointing in the direction of us having more local capacity. So uh, in energy, production, food, energy, uh, and so on. So I think that we are getting there. If you look at semiconductors, obviously one of the most critical areas, what Taiwan is doing because of the geopolitical risk and the environmental risk is almost to uh, globalize itself, to offshore 
and extend its own semiconductor production. So TSMC has invested in new plants in the United States, in uh, Japan, it's talking to Korea, and it will eventually perhaps go ahead and do that in India as well. Once India has a better capacity in terms of quality of uh, assets to be part of the semiconductor supply chain. So by globalizing these key industries, you're distributing the geography of production and creating a more resilient system overall. So I think we'll eventually get there in time. But, you know, the pandemic really obviously hit at a, at a time when we were already struggling uh, with capacity. So that's the reason for the double whammy. Yeah, no, for sure. Mark, let's come back to your point that with every one degree Celsius of uh, warming, there's going to be about a billion people displaced. And obviously, many of these people are not in a position to have the means to easily be mobile. Uh, they don't have the luxury or privilege of easily jumping to another country, arranging visas, getting work, so on and so forth. So as you're speaking to world leaders, what are you advising? Uh, how do we handle the fact that there may be people with so few resources, they cannot even uh, move from you know their their location to another location to escape these devastating effects of of climate change. How do we deal with this huge disparity in the means of uh, adaptation? Even as we try to mitigate climate change, which obviously is very very critical, we we are going to have to do some adaptation, particularly these very hard hit areas, be it in Bangladesh, be it other locations around the world. What is your counsel as you are talking to world leaders? Right. So there's like thematic answers in terms of policies and there's geographic answers because we have to remember that geography matters. Most human migration remains largely regionally concentrated. So if you're in South America you know, or Latin America, you're moving north. Look at the crisis on the border right now in Mexico. And let's remember that even if the U.S. continues to keep people out, that doesn't mean it's not a migration crisis because it is for Mexico. Mexico now has an estimated three or four million, um, you know, sort of asylum seekers and migrants that have come from South and Central America uh, who are now in Mexico. So there is this this shift. But that's different from the African situation where, you know, they're not crossing the Rio Grande. They're taking rafts across the Mediterranean. Um, and that's a devastating situation there as well. So the situation in different parts of the world varies based upon your geography, whether you're contiguous to the area that you are seeking to migrate to or not. One of the, a big theme in the book is Asian populations, which are heavily exposed to climate change. Um, and of course, they are already on the Eurasian landmass. And borders are either porous or there are actually stable relations between countries such that, and this gets to your question about what I'm working with leaders on, one thing is having tiers of residency. So when I work with governments, whether it's Kazakhstan or the United Arab Emirates or other countries, I say, look, you cannot have migration be an all or nothing situation. Right. There has to be a category for people who are arriving as asylum seekers and refugees or climate migrants or political refugees, a tier for people who are unskilled migrants but can find a role in your economy and earn points to stay in the country. For skilled migrants that you've recruited for certain sectors, you can have then you can have technology investors and entrepreneur uh, visas. And in Singapore, for example, you've got a tech pass, an entrepreneur pass, and then permanent residents and then citizens, right? And maybe you'll never become a citizen. Like all the Indians and Bangladeshis, there's 100,000 South Asians between Indians, Bangladeshis, and Nepalis in the, in the country of Japan. Who would have thought? Now, they're, they're not going to become Japanese citizens. They're hardworking, poor people working in construction and other areas. But they have undoubtedly con, con, uh, sort of contributed to the Japanese society. You don't think those Olympic stadiums would have been built if not for those South Asian construction workers. You don't think the city of Dubai or much of the Saudi Arabian infrastructure would have been built without them. So I think there is a recognition of the contribution that migrants make at all levels of the value chain and how important they are. When I am in Russia, which is, again, you know, the most depopulated, you know, large country by area in the world, well, next to Canada, um, when I, there's a different view in Moscow and from the Kremlin than when you go out to the Far East. When you go out to the Far East, they realize, oh, my God, we're a breadbasket, you know, um, and we need we need farmers. So they're actually recruiting Indian farmers. And then they say, wait, wait a minute. We're getting all this Chinese investment into railways and pipelines. Who's going to build all this? We're an aging country. Right. 
Uh, we need skilled labor in this in this area and that area. So the viewpoint out there, in fact, and I'll tell you another story. One uh, university administrator said, this is in Siberia, by the way. He said, we need to start teaching in English. We need to start capturing the Asian students to come and live here because we don't have enough young people. That's the real view on the ground. So actually, Jack, you know, a lot of people would think that this is uh, kind of, you know, populism and xenophobia versus uh, utopian dreaming. In fact, it's not. I'm pushing on an open door in most of these countries that we think no, of as xenophobic and populist. And that, that's, yeah. that's good news. That's a good thing. Yeah, that, that's definitely good to hear. But in addition to that, these, the natural market forces that are now being recognized, as you mentioned, do we also need a multi-stakeholder, multilateral fund to begin to address? There's already obviously island nations that have had to uh, leave and migrate out. This is going to happen more and more. Do we need an international effort starting now, which really starts to help those with the least resources uh, yes. that, that do not have the ability to be part yet of a positive migration cycle? What, what is your advice to our leaders on that, that demographic? Good. Well, you know, let, let's bring up the slide that I have up right now, which is about this distinction that you rightly raise between mitigation and adaptation. Again, yeah. the COP26 process, the all of climate diplomacy is all about mitigation, which is not a bad thing. It's a great thing. We need the Manhattan projects. We need to decarbonize industries. We need large scale renewable energy generation. We might even have to do more geoengineering, which is you know, becoming more of a vogue idea to talk about as much as it's un untested and unproven. But none of that, Jack, does anything for the hundreds of millions of people who are suffering the effects of dislocation from climate change and other phenomena every single day. For them and for us, we need adaptation. And I want to see commensurate investments in Manhattan projects for adaptation. Right. And that means some of the things that we've talked about already, movable infrastructure. Right. Uh, again, as, as Astro Teller says, movable cities. Right. We should be thinking about movable cities and obviously designing them in a more sustainable way, more climate proofing. And then what I put down there in blue, population resettlement. And Jack, let's remember, you will never hear those two words at a climate summit of world leaders. Why? Because they represent sovereign governments. Sovereignty, the purpose of sovereignty today, one of the main pillars and vestiges of sovereignty is to control the movement of people across borders. So you're not going to get heads of state from governments of sovereign countries to get together and voluntarily talk about um, large scale population resettlement. We have agreements on what to do in outer space and the oceans and many other things, but we will never have a global migration accord. And we need to, to remember that. So when I think about these things, you know, I, I, I look at what I call uh, programmable geography, right? And this is a central concept in the book. How do we stop, start thinking beyond sovereignty as much as we will never have, I mean, we have a world of sovereign governments. We've never had more sovereign states in history than we have today, 200 of them. So we should not be in denial about that. Right. You know, we in, in a way, nationalism is an extremely important force uh, that has that has delivered statehood and justice uh, for so many you know, colonial societies. And, and there's still stateless people today fighting for statehood. So there's nothing wrong with the state as such. But the state itself does not think in terms of the governance of the global commons. And for me, programmable geography is about saying, what is my territory that I am lucky enough to own on the basis of history of, of political geography, what can I do with it better? What is my contribution? What is, my, what is the role of my geography in the global division of labor? Can I absorb more people? Can I produce more food? Can I generate solar power and pipe it um, you know, uh, through, through a, a high voltage transmission cables to other locations? Right. These are the am I an important conduit for the movement of import, essential goods and services? Am I a passageway for trade? Countries have to think about their role in this global division of labor and programmable geography is about saying, OK, we have sovereign states, but let's move beyond that. Let's move technologies to people and people to resources. And that's how we get to a more optimal kind of structure, one that's built more around kind of stewardship than just uh, a, a sovereignty. So, so, you know, the critical sort of, you know, thing to remember or action item 
is moving um, technologies to people where they need them. Again, I think that's something that obviously Google has made a mission out of, you know, very, very wisely and, and you know, candidly, very positively and, and humanely. Um, but also you have to think about moving people to uh, resources. And, you know, this is what I call the agenda for, for humanity, right? It's really about a realignment of these geographies that are out of sync and focusing on that civilization 3.0 of mobile and sustainable habitats for a population that could be on the move again. Because Jack, you know, I set out to answer that question, where will you live in 2050? And the answer is not one place because you can't be so sure in a volatile and complex world that that place you've chosen is gonna remain pristine and idyllic either from a climatological standpoint or a political standpoint. So we have to be prepared for all of us, rich and poor, right, to be more mobile. Let's remember the forest fires in California, as well as the floods in Bangladesh, um, right? So, so really all of us have to, have to build that mobility into our infrastructure, into our way of life. But to do so in a way that's not like Stone Age people, right, obviously, but using the technologies at our disposal today. Yeah, Prague, and that just brings us to our final question. Let's come back to the issue of work and the future in the geographic context. Uh, we've seen a lot of different companies in the last six months make announcements about work from home, either uh, unlimited, you know, in the future, if you want to work from home, that's fine, or very flexible type of arrangements. What are you seeing when you speak to CEOs? We see a lot of tech companies taking a very a forward-looking stance on this. Other companies, professional service companies, such as the big consulting companies, are also leaning into this very heavily. What trends are you seeing uh, with this, Prague? And uh, how do you see this playing out, not only in the tech sector and consulting sector, but maybe other parts of the economy as well? Right. So, you know, I think there's different answers depending on, you know, what industry you're looking at, how mature or evolved they are in terms of embracing, you know, remote work. Um, we've got a lot of extreme propositions out there. People saying, um, oh, yes, you know, I'm off. I'll be, you know, I'll be in a time zone and you will have no idea where I am. And, uh, you know, I expect to have my headquarters salary. And then you have companies saying, uh, uh, party's over, come back from Tulum and Bali and you you got a report for duty. Somewhere in between is, and this is, it's so interesting, Jack, I don't want to go on a long 19th century meditation around geopolitical you know, theory, but longitude has always been extremely important actually in geopolitics. And the regionalism I was talking about earlier is coming back. So you've got the, the middle ground is companies saying, okay, asynchronous work is not efficient. Right. I start a Google Doc in my morning in Asia and then you work on it later and then, you know, it takes us days to get things done. So it's live wherever you want in within this three hour time zone band. Right. So you can be down in Tierra del Fuego and I can be up in Anchorage, Alaska or whatever, but we need to be roughly the same thing. or business travel is going to come back. So you need to be, you know, near one of these 15 hubs that has a good airport and where we're going to rent a new co-working lease, a new co-working space. And every month you guys will get together in that hub. Something like that is probably where things will, will settle down. So again, a happy medium, not an extreme scenario, something that has evolved, something that is, that is productive, something that I think is actually healthy, quite frankly, for all of us, you know, who are overworked and, you know, spend too much time, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the office anyway. So I, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about this. And just one last point. This is a, a book that champions youth, right? Uh, the protagonist in my research are the 4.5 billion young people on this planet. We must retrofit everything to ensure their maximal survivability and, um, and, and that they thrive in the future, right? This is extremely important for our species. And it is related to your more narrow question because we have to build in this re resilience and connectivity and optionality so that people can be in different places and be connected and be good contributors to society and earn good wages and that kind of thing. So, you know, the answer to your question, there's a direct link to it and enabling the mobility of youth. And we have to, 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 to do that, uh, you know, for our long-term, uh, for our, for, our, for, for our long-term species health, if you will. Great. Well, Prague, I want to thank you very much on behalf of Google and talks at Google 
It's great to have you once again. I'm sure you'll be writing more books and we'll have you back again. But I encourage the audience to both check out uh, Prague's current book, Move, and uh, which is, I think, just coming out right now. I think next week, October 12th, at least in the U.S. and other countries as well. Uh, but also take a look back at some of Prague's previous work. It's really worth looking at. It's very thought provoking. And Prague, I want to thank you for the kind of discussions you've been able to catalyze, not only here at Google, but, but around the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jack. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.